A lot of investors out there will start and stop with the numbers. And that's a problem because investing is more than just numbers, more than just math or, or pretty market cap. And, 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 and they'll find these numbers and they'll be like, OK, it's a great stock. And you see a lot of YouTubers and a lot of people on, on social media sites like Reddit or Quora or Twitter only looking at the numbers. And that's that's where you you can fail. And to minimize your risk of losing money, maximize your risk of making money, you want to apply 4M analysis. So here it is. So the 4Ms, you've got margin of safety, meaning moat management. Welcome to the Feast Over Famine podcast. On this podcast, we're navigating the tension that we find where mission and profit collide. We're talking to CEOs, founders, executive directors, impact investors, and all of what we've identified as the global ecosystem of the social enterprise, business for transformation, business as mission landscape. We're talking to them about the obstacles they face, the strategic challenges they've been through, how they're funded, how they were started, and everything that's happened in between. We are trying to share their story in a way that's impactful to help us all to grow the social enterprise space for the better. Enjoy this week's episode with your host, Ryan Mahaffey. All right, everyone. Welcome to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We're really stoked you guys are here listening in and uh, excited to have another kind of conversation in the financial investing, impact investing uh, realm of this whole puzzle that is the social enterprise ecosystem. And so uh, we have Sean Tepper. Sean's out in Wisconsin. I've known Sean for a couple of years. He's the founder and CEO of Ticker, an amazing product we're going to talk about, uh, a tool that I'm using and that I'm really, really excited to share with you guys. So Sean, welcome to the podcast, man. Ryan, good to be here. How are you doing? We're good. We're good. Yeah. And so I was on your podcast year, year and a half ago at this point. It's was, it was probably a while ago. And um, it sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. And now I finally got off my uh, lazy butt and started doing more with my own portfolio. And so I've been talking to you about a lot of that and using sure. ticker. And I was like, okay, I finally get it. Let's have you on the podcast now and, and connect some dots. Right so I'm pretty excited about that. Right on. Why don't we, Sean, kick off with a little of your story. Um, just a little bit of like how you ended up here, why you're into tech, why you're kind of a tech startup CEO, founder kind of guy. Um, and, and kind of just start there with a little of your background. Sure, I'll, I'll take just a few minutes here, and, and if people want to know details, they can always reach out. So my background is, is about like 15 years in software engineering, primarily as a project manager. Um, I had a business from 2006 through 2010. It was an agency, so building websites and software, and we did some social media um, for small and mid-sized businesses. Now, I have to say that that was a really tough road through the recession. Um, I, I learned what it really feels like to create your own business, especially your first yeah. business, especially a service business, um, and didn't really make a lot of money those those years. And it, it was frustrating, but we got to work with a few hundred different businesses. And what what I'm really into and I didn't really respect it at the time is I like learning about different business models, how do they market, mm. sell, operate, so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, we did grow a little bit that fourth year, 2010, and we went through a merger. Now, it wasn't like a big liquidity event like, hey, here's a few million bucks. You get to walk away and retire. It was yeah. none of that. <laughs> it was uh, all debts and liabilities were removed, which was great. It gave me a fresh start. So Got it. at that cool. point... I knew after the four years what kind of business I wanted to create. I wanted a SaaS business, um, but I didn't have any ideas. So what do I do? So I essentially- SaaS being I, software as a service for those that don't know that. Correct. Yep. Yep. You got it. Highly scalable. You're not selling any physical inventory. Um, you think like um, examples for the audience to relate to are like membership sites like Netflix or Spotify. You're yep. paying Resume. to get access yep. to something. Exactly. Yeah. Resume is perfect. Um, so anyway, yeah, the last 10 years worked for large businesses, a few publicly traded companies, including GE, and really learned how those businesses operate, sell, market, so on and so forth. So again, great experience. Never really loved that career, but as, as yeah. just being physically responsible and, you know, <laughs> getting a paycheck. 
At the same time, I got into investing and it was more angel investing, which means investing in private businesses. It was either time or money. And my expectation was to get in early at the ground level of like a tech business, see mm. it go to a thousand percent. And again, retire and right off to the sunset. Well, um, a lot easier said than done. <laughs> And there's and a I theme didn't, here. <laughs> there is. There, there's a track record, but there's there's also a correction, and that happens yeah. right now. <laughs> so yeah. I did that for about five years, and I'm like, I could be swinging for the fences the next 20 years and not generate yeah. anything for wealth, and it's just not financially responsible. So I I turn my attention to the stock market, turn to guys like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and those guys have said that. If they were just managing a few million dollars of their own money, they could make consistent returns that range between 15 and 50%. And I took a step back and I'm like, okay, so if they're able to generate those kind of returns, that means they're not using emotions or feelings. These are not, right? These are not gambling men, yep. um, which means they're using some sort of logic to kick things off, mm. which means there's math. And I, I decided I'm going down the rabbit hole. I read as many books as I could. <laughs> got on the YouTube train and watched as many videos as I could and started testing different calculations in Excel to see what works and doesn't work. And I will say there's a lot of noise out there and there's a lot of investors that still use like um, platforms or systems and calculations that don't have the rigor. There's not enough data there to really make a, a logical decision. So yep. fortunately, I ran across the guy. We'll talk about him a little bit, but his name is Phil Town. He wrote a few books, two of which are Rule One. The other one is Payback Time. And he provided more rigor, in other words, more calculations around like the revenue growth rates, the net income, which is our profits over to cash flow. Um, you're looking at debt. But I was just blown away by the amount of math he uses to make a decision. I put everything together in an Excel sheet to help help make decisions. And I started tweaking this thing a little bit. And I used it over the course of four years for myself. And my returns were between 15 and 15 percent, 15 and 50 percent, sometimes a little higher. That brought me to about 2019. I'm like, OK, I've got something here. Yeah. Let's start sharing this with some people. And I started sharing it with retail investors, just regular people like you and I, and then some institutions and everybody, they had the pretty much the same question. When are you going to turn this into a software to share with others? Yeah. And doing the yeah. math and having those Excel spreadsheets is, it can be a full-time job if you're doing it that way. It, it is to give you context to analyze one stock, although it was very accurate for me to generate some great returns and find some great stocks. It would take me about five to 10 minutes to analyze one stock. And it was literally like copy and paste from Yahoo or MSN money, right? Yeah. Free sites, grabbing every data point from those uh, financial statements, putting it into this Excel to get the get the results. And there are a yeah. lot of losers, but of course, I'd find a few winners, make the investment, make some great returns and move on. But and I think like, I can baseline analyze five to 10 stocks in one minute on ticker. Oh, it almost yeah. flips that, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, well, these are the 10 I'm thinking about. I've kind of vetted them on that. I'm going to drop all 10 into ticker and decide if it's worth it. We'll talk about what that means, but it's it, right. it's really flipped that from a time standpoint, which is great. It, exactly. It's a huge time saver. And and um so going back to the timeline, 2019, we I started working on this thing. I finally, after 10 years, I had my SaaS idea, software as a service membership <laughs> platform. Yep, yep. Only took a decade. Um, but uh, yeah, launched in 2020. And now, as of today, we've been live just over a year and a half. We have a little over 4,000 customers global. Um, and I'll just, I'll speak for one more minute here and we can dive yeah, in. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got a lot of customers from all over the world. So the US and Canada are hot, but we have a lot of customers from Europe. Um, South Asia is growing really fast. So Indonesia, huh. Singapore, India, Philippines, and then um, Australia, New Zealand. And we've got stocks we've got. We just broke 30,000 stocks. We're always adding new, it seems like every week. Um, but we've got a little over 30,000 stocks globally. So no matter where you live in the world, um, you can definitely find some good investments. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, cool. So that so thanks for that background. It's super helpful. Mm -hmm. And I want to get into what some of that rule one investing is. Sure. I want to get in value investing. I want to get into some of those principles. I want to get into how ticker functions and then how we take some of that and, and obviously promote what you guys are doing because I think it's a piece of the puzzle. Um, 
but to just kind of set the stage, like some people might be listening to this, like, Ryan, what does this have to do with social enterprise impact investing and all this? And, and so it's really important to us to look at the entirety of the global economic marketplace and think about how we can redeem it for social good. And let's be real. I mean, small businesses and private investments, angel investments and startups, things, you know, the uh, project in Africa that you might be supporting the business project or business um, entity over there, a, uh, a social enterprise here in Denver or in Milwaukee or something. Those are having a huge impact and they always have a huge impact, but these massive global companies, we just saw this with, uh, with Russia, these massive publicly traded companies can have a major impact on the, on the right. global world. And so what I don't want to do when we talk about and think about social enterprise impact investing is just focus on the small private investment, uh, private opportunity fundraising, these smaller ones and leave out 90% of the global economic dollars that are out there because we need to go tackle that space too. And I think that a way that people can impact the holistic part of that is to think about their investment portfolio from their 401k to their IRA as to how that's being invested and start to think differently about it from mutual funds they're investing in or not investing in, which we'll talk about mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. management of some of these companies. And if it's ethical and start to take control of that and think about it differently. And I, and my hope is that challenges wealth management advisors and all those things. So that's kind of just setting the stage for anybody listening, saying, I don't, I'm not following what this has to do with it. You guys are just talking about <laughs> investing. Sure. That's where I want to go. And I personally really believe as I've gone on a journey with this stuff, I believe that I am making a bigger impact through my finances and my investments than I ever have before. And so I want everyone else to do that. So that's kind of setting the playing field. So Sean, why don't we start with what is rule one investing, value investing, the four M's? I know you might be getting rid of that on your platform or something, so you can talk to it how you will. Uh, let's talk about that first, and then we can talk about ticker uh, because I feel like ticker is basically built off of some of those things sure. in a sense. Yeah, so rule one is, and, and I love this, is one of my favorite quotes from Warren Buffett is rule one, don't lose money. Rule two, <laughs> don't forget rule one. Um, yep. <laughs> So, and Phil Town has really adopted that. And Phil Town's philosophy is very much built on value investing. There's four investment strategies when you look at the stock market. Number one, you have value investing, which is investing in stocks that have really strong financials. And they're usually safer investments. It's, it's not like you're a, a risky play, like a GameStop, for example, is not a value stock. Um, yeah. So value stocks are really safe. Then you have growth stocks. Growth stocks can be really fast growing like tech stocks. Um, sometimes they can have good financials. Sometimes they won't and they will still grow yeah. really fast. Um, then there's speculative stocks. That's where most stocks arrive. They are, in ticker, they show up as red. Uh, so you can definitely avoid <laughs> those. Those are like the GameStops and the AMCs. Those, those are the ones that I'm always texting you about and be like, I don't know. This one's only a little red. It's not completely red. What yeah, do you think? I, I like, a penny stop stock the red for, ones. <laughs> I, I found a penny stock for a buck fifty that's got a two out of 20. Should I get in? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> totally. Um, um, totally. And then the fourth category are dividend stocks and dividends are fine. It's just when you start making really good returns with your investment returns, dividends is kind of like icing on the cake. You're not really going to yep. focus on it as much. Um, and so, so what yeah. we're talking about here is that value investing portion. And really the mentality around this is long-term financial independence, right? It's a, it's not a quick win, uh, one year in, one year out, you make a ton of money, you're good. It's a, hey, these, and you're going to talk to this, but I just kind of want to put the framework there. Like, right. These are investments that, hey, I believe in this company is going to be bigger, better in some way in 10 years. And that's really mm -hmm. the the mindset here. So you're not really, and I, and I think the other quote that from Warren Buffett that I believe from Warren Buffett is like, he doesn't care if the stock market disappeared for five years and he couldn't access his money. Because when it turns back on and all those companies are revalued, they're going to be revalued higher because that's why he did that. So just to put people in the framework, like we're not talking about day trading. We're not talking about quick hit. We're not talking about get rich quick. We're talking about long-term investing, which everybody who's listening to this is doing. If you have a 401k, if you have your right. money in a savings account, uh, any of it, you're doing this in some way. And so right. it's wrapping your head around it. Okay. So Moving then into the value investing portion of this, break that down then of that portion. Yeah. So with value investing, where where you and you're right, you make your biggest returns when you buy and hold, but 
where you really make your biggest returns, and this is something that Ticker helps you with, is buying when those stocks make dips, when they go down. Like recently, we've had the turmoil with Russia and Ukraine. There's also the interest rates um, yep. or inflation rates that are rising. We're taking interest rates and increasing those to pull back the inflation rates. Yep. And then and then the residuals of COVID, you know, uh, Omicron did spike up, I think, in November 2021. Which And these things caused the market to go down, but fortunately, Ticker will continue monitoring great businesses. And if they remain green, but yet they're going down, that's where you you implore or use the number one most po powerful strategy around value investing, which I think fills on for this, which is called stockpiling. Stockpiling is buying more shares as they're down, because when the market turns around and goes back up, that's where you make incredible returns. You build your wealth much faster. Yep. So talk to me about the, the, the four M's thing or however you're going to talk yeah. about it now. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about those because I think, so we're basically saying, okay, here's the philosophy around it. And, and now we're saying, you know, really if someone is managing their own portfolio like this, they're managing 20 to 30. Like, I mean, I think Motley Fool says something, I saw some today, it's like 30 to 60, but 20, yeah, t somewhere between 15 and 35 or right. somewhere in there is the amount of stocks. And so you're kind of handpicking these and rooting for them. These are the companies you're investing in. And uh, most of us aren't investing enough that the CEO of, Garmin is going to call me and say, Oh, thanks so much for putting that money in. You know, you're the best, like it's pennies to them. And that's just how mm -hmm. the stock market works. But the point is you're putting your money somewhere. And so by choosing the 25 to 30 companies that it's in, you can, maybe you're not necessarily having a huge impact, but you're not having a negative impact. And that's kind of where ESG comes in. But I guess talking sure. about the four M's and how analyzing businesses on these levels actually translates to supporting better companies to thrive. Yeah, and I'll, I'll touch on ESG in a moment. What I want to do is talk about the 4Ms. And the 4Ms, we're, we're going to keep it in ticker. We're going to keep the name 4M. Okay. And, and to define what that is, is a lot of investors out there will start and stop with the numbers. And that's a problem because investing is more than just numbers, more than just math or, or pretty market cap. And, 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 and they'll find these numbers and they'll be like, okay, it's a great stock. And you see a lot of YouTubers and a lot of people on, on social media sites like Reddit or Quora or Twitter only looking at the numbers. And that's yeah. that's where you, you can fail. And to minimize your risk of losing money, maximize your risk of making money, you want to apply 4M analysis. So here it is. So the 4Ms, you've got margin of safety, meaning moat management. Margin of safety is the math part. And that's something that Ticker does for us automatically, which is great. But... Something else that Ticker is also doing for us a little bit, it guides you along the way, is helps you understand the meaning of the business. Like, is this a business model that's going to be around in the next 10 years? Mm. Um, right. Um, with a moat, that's the competitive advantage, how many competitors you have in the market. And then with the management, that's the track record of a CEO. And this 4M tool, which we're revamping right now, will kind of guide you along the way. And it will also crowdsource information from the ticker community. For example, some people may click on a stock and they may not know any of the competitors. Well, fortunately, the crowd already did that hard work for you. So you can get right. through these this forum analysis a lot easier. But if you can, if you can get a high 4M score, your probability of making money is extremely high. I can't say 100%, but when I apply a 4M, I tell you what, the last Gosh, it's seven, eight years now I've been in the stock market. I've, I've done very well by applying this philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can do that. There's a lot to break down in that. I mean, you can mm -hmm. apply those four M's by doing a ton of research, right? Right. Or you can apply those four M's by just going into areas that you know well, right? Yeah. And so I'll use, I'll use a personal example. One of the stocks that I invested in was Garmin. I'm, I race mountain bikes. I'm on Strava all the time. I've got a Garmin watch. I, my brain psychologically recognizes that industry. I'm in and out of stores. I'm seeing the athletes they're supporting. I'm seeing right. their competitors. I was just like, okay, yeah. You know, like meaning, yeah. Are they going to be around in 10 years? Like, are they doing these things? Is that they're, yeah. Moat, do they have a competitive advantage? And yeah, totally. You know, they're competitors. Yes. Are they doing things? Are they, 
I just innately knew that. I mean, yeah, I looked up a little bit of stuff to just kind of refresh, but I was like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Right. And then management, I didn't know, but you just, that's easy to look up to some degree. You can kind of look that up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the, the margin of safety side, you know, that's where ticker came in. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't know the math. And so, so anyways, just as an example, it doesn't necessarily mean doing all this research, you know, it can, there's been stocks for me that have come up and I'm like, well, that's interesting, but I know nothing about that industry. Uh, but it's interesting enough. I'm going to go off the deep end a little, and then it turned out to be a good choice. You know, sure. for example, like a Lockheed Martin, I don't know anything about defense contracting. That's not mm-hmm. my natural bend of what I'm into. I know enough right. to that, but I'll give you an example, Lockheed Martin. One of the reasons that was a organization I want to look into is because being here in Colorado and working in the nonprofit space, they, they're philanthropic uh, endeavors are huge. The amount of organizations they support, how they support them, the way they do it. That alone for me to go to the social enterprise impact investing angle, I was like, wow, I want to invest in companies like that, you know? Right. And so that tells me something about leadership. That tells me something about the culture of it. And let's be honest, we all know that if those kinds of things are happening, the company is going to be run well and it's going to grow anyways. You know, you get really mm-hmm. good servant hearted leadership, you get a good culture, you're giving back to the community, you're doing those things like you know, those, it, those things usually lead to a company doing really well. Right. It's the companies that are terrible to their employees and have that bad thing. I'll use a Vail Resorts <laughs> as an example. Something yes. came out the other day about Vail Resorts. And I was like, you know, on some investment newsletter thing, and I was like, nope, not touching it. And I'm not beating up Vail Resorts. I kind of am. But if you talk to people around Colorado, mm-hmm. they don't have the best representation of culture at their, at their right. headquarters over the past. So you can start to see the end point I'm making here is you start to look at these companies, you can start to see the trends and the themes where doing these forums right to make it a good business opportunity is actually very similar to doing the things right to have a positive impact on the world through the global economy. And I think mm-hmm. that's just like really special. So I'd be curious from you as I lay out some examples of that and putting those things together and, and let's leave margin of safety out of it for now. Cause we, that's a whole nother sure. pile that we'll talk about, but for the meaning and the moat and the management side, talk to me about how you've used that or how that's played in for the social impact side for you. Yeah. So, so like you, I, I tend to focus on what I know. So I know tech really well. That's where I've been working in the last 15 years. So I hold, I hold all tech stocks. Now there's people out there that say that's really risky, but I have hundred percent conviction in every business I hold. I hold 10 stocks, a very focused portfolio. And like you mentioned before, like, like some guys, Motley Fool, I've heard say 25 stocks, sometimes more. If you have too many, you end up creating essentially your own index fund and you're not going to have those market beating returns. So, you know, Warren, Charlie, these guys like, you know, between five and 15, Ben Graham, I think was like between 15 and 20 or something like that. Um, So keep it focused. But what I do with the meaning is I already know the types of industries that are like that box is checked for me because I know they're going to be around because I know this industry. Um, so the meaning box is super easy. The moat, that's where I, I will actually do a little homework. I'll compare. Let's say it's a stock I see in ticker. I'll, I'll compare what the numbers look yeah. like to his competitors. And the 4M tool will do that for us here. This new version. I can't wait for that. So it shows cool. you it stacks them right next to each other. Who are your competitors? Where do they rank in the platform? Awesome. Done, right? Yeah, because like, I usually had to do that on my own. When I was investing in Target, I was like, okay, I'll pull up Walmart and Costco and exactly. got like five tabs open. And I'm like, can't I just put this all side Forget by side it. and see how they stack? Exactly. So that's cool that you guys are doing that. Yeah. And then with a the glass door, culture is a big deal. So check this out. There's actually a correlation. There's a few investors that ran tests with portfolios on high glass door ratings and market returns. And typically oh, wow. stocks with higher glass door ratings equate to a better culture, which actually equates to a a better share price growth rate or better returns. Because it's, you know, your leadership can only do so much. It's the people who execute the vision. It's the employees. And if they like working there, you're going to see better returns. So we're going to have Glassdoor in our platform. It's going to show that. Um, Interesting. it's It's going to show the track record, or at least if the share price has increased over the last five years with the CEO. It's kind of like, you know, if you're the GM, I'm going to use American football, for example, even though a lot of our customers are global. So soccer. Yeah. Yeah. We can use American football for now. That's fine. Right. If you're a GM and you need to bring in a new quarterback, are you going to go to the, like the local high school look for some kid who's got a decent arm? Are you going to go like to some team that has a incredible quarterback who's one 
won championships before and won Super Bowls, obviously you're going for the winning track record. Yeah. Right? Somebody with yeah. real experience. So with with CEOs, you want somebody who has that track record. They've done it before. You know, if you yeah. can, if you get a CEO at a company that's done great things before, your probability of seeing your share price increase is significantly higher. Cool. All right, everyone, I want to take a quick break from today's episode and just share a little bit about Impact Foundation, who's got an incredibly awesome model of using impact investment, charitable dollars, and funding tons of projects all over the world right now. What if your investments could change the world? At Impact Foundation, they believe business with purpose has the power to transform society. Purpose built for impact investing, Impact Foundation provides a streamlined way to fund businesses that seek social and spiritual transformation or make loans to charity, all while earning a financial return to grow your giving. Donors and investors have already supported more than 200 redemptive enterprises through their impact accounts. They provide needed fuel for companies that exist as a force of God's redemptive work in the world. To learn more about what they're doing in their kingdom impact investing model, visit impactfoundation.org. So let's move to kind of the margin of safety then. So um, fiscal stewardship is important. Blowing money, mm-hmm. wasting money isn't great. Right. So Lockheed Martin is an example. I'll go back to that. And I'm just using an example because it's top of mind for me. Mm-hmm. Huge philanthropic giving, which means they want to manage their finances well and steward their profits well to give and be generous. And right. so if you margin of safety, the math of this whole thing is built on the financial health of the company. A company that doesn't have proper financial health isn't going to be able to give back to the community because they're going to be focused on, on themselves and what they need to do. And they're going to be in debt right. and paying that off. And so again, if you're just investing for the sake of investing and making a return and, and you want to steward your own financials, well, you should care about margin of safety. On the flip side, caring about margin of safety and the math of this stuff actually leads to you ending up investing in companies that are going to have a bigger impact. They're going to pay their employees better, that are going to return yes. that better. They're not going to be deeply in debt with a lot, which a lot of people have convictions for. I mean, these are principles and things that have an impact. And then in the best case scenario, they're a Lockheed Martin where they're giving it away and being philanthropic. And there's plenty of organizations doing that. Right. So talk to me a little bit about my hope is everyone can kind of agree on what I just said there, that mm-hmm. that's good. And, and are just connecting these dots. Talk to me about the margin of safety and how it works and the sticker price versus a share price and some of these things. Sure. Um, I don't want to go too into the weeds, but I also want people to understand this whole buying five, $10 bills for $5 kind of thing and like yes. why that matters. So can you break that down just a little bit? And, and I think this Absolutely. is the key piece of ticker, right? So this is, uh, I want everyone to hear this math and I want everyone to hear like, go to Sean's platform right now after hearing this, because it's so amazing <laughs> that they're doing this math. So this is your sure. shameless self-promotion and you're educating us a little on the math. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Ben Graham, who was Warren Buffett's teacher, we're going back a hundred years now. It's, it's hard to believe, but he came up with a concept called the margin of safety. And essentially there is a way you can calculate the intrinsic value or otherwise known as the sticker price or fair value of a stock, which is the real value it is today. And back in his time, you used to use the share price growth rate. It's no longer, some people still use that, but we use the EPS growth rate, which thank you, Phil Town, he did provide that, but we added a little more rigor to it. Long story short, we calculate what the real value of a share is today. So for example, um, I was looking at Microsoft yesterday. Microsoft has a sticker price of $1,500. Its share price is about 300. That's an 80% margin of safety. And you want to, what Ticker does is it, it turns stocks green when they have a margin of safety of 50% or more. So and that's the rule that mm-hmm. Ben Graham, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, and of course, Phil Town, they talk about as well, try to find stocks that have a 50% or more uh, margin of safety. So yeah. educate people a little bit on how that happens. So they're like, okay, wait. I'm tracking with you. I'm obviously, I'm buying it for $300 and all the math is telling me it's actually worth $1,500. Right. Um, great deal. Like you're getting it right. on sale yes. essentially, but uh, this crazy stock market thing and all these, uh, how does that even happen? You know? And like, what, how does something get that lopsided? Is it that people don't value it? Is it that the grocery store bought too many avocados and had to get rid of them before they <laughs> spoiled and put it on sale? You know what I mean? Like our, sure. our general consumer understanding of something being on sale and the reasons why it would be on sale. 
uh, doesn't necessarily match to like how this works. So can you kind of break down a little bit of like how that ends up happening? Yeah. So there's some investors that they believe in what's called efficient market theory, which is the, the price you see of a stock is the value it's at at its given moment. And that's not true. And a lot of successful investors in the past have determined there are ways, like I said, you can calculate the intrinsic value, the real value. And that's that's based on, we use the EPS growth rate, long story short, earnings per share is the profitability of a business. If the profitability of the business keeps increasing year over year, which we calculate, that value increases more and more. Now, what happens is institutions, this doesn't always happen, but institutions and retail investors, they're, they're really the two big segments of the investor population. They're not always going to be buying all those shares, which means they're behind the eight ball, which is a good thing. They're not, they don't have all these shares bought, which means that share price is lower than the actual intrinsic value. And this happens a lot. Now, there are cases when something becomes overbought and ticker would then show it as red, which means you probably at that point, all right, you, you probably made a profit, time to sell out, get out. Yeah, awesome. And this isn't necessarily tied to the margin of safety, but I feel like it mm -hmm. ties into the score and ticker. So the other piece mm -hmm. of the math is the score that they get. And right. this is a zero out of 20. Um, and it's pretty cool. T briefly, just go through mm -hmm. like what what are the categories that go into that score? Because I think basically you're saying, okay, here's what the market for all these reasons of how it works. This is what they're valuing Microsoft at 300. But based on all these financial metrics, which goes into what the score is, it, the value of it is actually probably more like 1500 because I see the writing on the wall. This is a financially healthy, profitable company. And in 10 years, it's going to grow to that. And so really it's not just about the margin of safety and ticker. It's also the, um, the score, because I've, I mean, I'm sure there's a company out there that's a four out of 20 on financials, but somehow with what's going on in the market, they end up as like an 80% margin of safety. I mean, maybe that wouldn't happen, but there's it, it could end up Sometimes a little lopsided, does. so it's tying those things together. So, talk to me about what those metrics are and why they're important. Yes, so and just for context, if anybody is curious, all of our calculations are open source. You can go to our yeah. site ticker.com, you, oh, you can download it. This is one thing that really made us different from a lot of screeners out there, is we believe in transparency, right? Like, so go ahead, you can yep. use these calculations, create your own version of ticker. Of course, we still hope you use ticker, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but the score you're right now to give context out there, there's people out there that say value investing is dead, and that's kind of a naive comment because they're only focusing on margin of safety. They run into what's called value traps, which you're right. It could be a low score stock. We'll talk about the score here in a second. We'll just summarize it. But it could be a low score stock and have a high MLS or margin of safety and they'll get in and they'll lose money and be like, what the heck? Value investing is dead. Well, this is where Phil Towns teaching came into play. And that's the rigor is what he looks at. And I'll list the different things he looks at, which is, and I'll briefly explain each, but we look at return on investment capital, which in layman's terms is the money that a business makes, are they turning it around to reinvest in the business to grow the business, right? That's what you want to see. You don't want to see those profits going towards the CEO salary so they can buy a second yacht, right? <laughs> totally. Yep. <laughs> right. So ROIC, return on invested capital, then the EPS, which is that profitability. We also look at the cash the cash growth rate. And then we look at the equity growth rate, which is on the, the balance sheet that relates to like lower debts, stronger financials. And we like to see all those metrics growing year over year. And we look at the last five years. So this way you reach a green status. Our summary is either it's currently on sale, watch or overpriced. That's the key thing you want to pay attention to. It's on sale if your score is high and your MOS is high. You need those two yeah. things to hit green. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a gray or red. Um, so in, it's got enough rigor in place. So you're in most cases, you're not going to make a bad decision. Totally, totally. And I'm just pulling it up now because I thought that uh, um, this Lockheed Martin example I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. It's actually when I texted you about because I was like, oh, sure. you know, because so I'm thinking about all this stuff and we're talking about. So they were a uh, a score of 15 and a margin of safety of 37 and they're a watch, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a green score and 15 is pretty high. 
37%. Interesting. It's almost to that 50. And so there's a little bit of thinking about it, you know, and that might be right. a scenario where I say, okay, I can pick X company with terrible CEO. They don't get back to the community. They don't do anything like that. And they're like an 80 and a 15, or I could pick mm-hmm. Lockheed that's a 15 30 and let my convictions play into that. And I think that's, right. you know, you, that's, you want to be careful between social good convictions and, and supporting good companies versus emotion, right? Those are right. two different things. You don't want to make stupid financial decisions just for that. Although I would right. argue sometimes you do, um, <laughs> but, but hopefully there's a balance line there that people could find that it's not always doing that. So, so that's super helpful. And then thank you for sharing that about ticker and all, and all those details. So let's shift a little bit to like what someone might do with all this information. Cause we're throwing a lot out of them. And, and some right. people might be like, it's okay. I mean, I remember my first call with you, Sean, and you just like yeah. blew me away. And I was like, I need to go listen to 500 podcasts because my brain just melted. <laughs> and so um, sure. my hope is we've kept this enough in layman's terms, but I also know it's really hard to wrap the head around. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of want to talk about like what, where, where most people might be at right now and what to do next, what to do next. And what I don't want this to turn into necessarily, I don't want people to hear is like that we're bashing financial advisors and wealth no. managers and saying no. they don't exist because they are extremely important. So talk to me, I guess, label to me the characteristics of someone that could go out and do some of this value investing on their own. Like, are there certain things they're good at? Like, you know, like when should someone say, Oh, I might be able to do that. And then we'll talk about a little bit about institutions and mutual funds and where some of that is. But if someone's kind of thinking, Oh, I might want to do this. Like what, what would they be good at? Or what would they, what would kind of make sense for them to, to do? So I like your comment there on financial advisors because we do have a lot of advisors that use this platform, some of it for themselves. Sometimes they use it with their customers. And you're right. Like there is still value for, you know, going to an advisor. Um, we we can talk about what they put you in, which is fine. It's, it's usually mutual funds, index funds or ETFs, which are essentially a bundle of stocks. And we can talk about that in a moment. But if you're brand new, you know, it, it can be a nerve wracking position to be in. Okay, so you're, you're going to get your first stock. Where do you start? And we always tell people start small, start with between a hundred and a thousand dollars to get into the market. And your first objective is not to make money. It's to increase confidence. You want to get mm-hmm. in and you want to monitor that stock. Now you don't want to just sit on that one investment for three, six, 12 months. You know, that's the discipline of investing every month, kind of like you would a 401k. There's money always going in every month. That's where you build your yep. wealth, but confidence is key. And that's why with Ticker, we're really big on education, especially Mm. simplified terms. Like, you know, finance can be filled with a lot of $20 words that nobody knows what they mean, (laughs) right? (laughs) Totally. We break things down in simple terms. So really focus on education at Ticker. Right Mm. now, it's all on ticker.com. But the new platform at Ticker, which should be launched in the next one to two months, as we record this podcast episode, it's late uh, March. Um, Yeah. We're going to have an educational module kind of inspired by Duolingo, where it's like language learning apps, where it steps Mm. through simple things like when to buy and when to sell and how to reduce risk, stuff like that. So our education is about to get a facelift, but, but you can read everything on our site, start there. And then you want to, you want to find a a stock or two or three and, and move forward. You know, that's, and one thing I will say this. And this will be in our education. There's a lot of investors look at stocks as either a win or a loss, either going to make money or lose money. And it's actually a win-win. And the reason is, in most cases, it's a win-win because you're not investing in stocks, you're investing in businesses. You got to put your mindset Mm -hmm. in that position. Businesses generate products or create products and services to solve problems, and they're going to continue generating revenue. And in most cases, you're going to make a little money or a lot of money. It's the difference in what you pick. So if you ride out storms like now, you're probably going to make money at the end of it, no matter what. I can't guarantee 100% of the time, but what ticker is going to help you do is find the the real winners where you make those bigger returns. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if someone's like, well, is it all about making money? Well, it's about financial independence and everyone is going to retire someday. Mm -hmm. You might want to retire at 50 or 65 or 80. That doesn't mean you're going to sit at a golf club and just not do anything, but 
you know, I love shifting away from retirement to shifting to financial independence because financial independence, right. we're not going to be able to work every day the rest of our life. We're not going to be able to create cash flow every day. So in some ways we do need to save, we do need to invest, we need to do that. And almost everyone is putting money into a 401k if they're working somewhere <clears throat> or savings or something. And so this is really taking hold of that on your own in a unique way. Right. And so look at it as if, Hey, if you're financially independent, by the time you're 50, you go volunteer the rest of your life with nonprofits or NGOs in Africa, or you could go whatever it is or whatever you want it to be. There's a reason to care about and do that. So I think that's super helpful. So let's, um, and, and I think financial advisors and wealth managers, they look at the whole picture, right. And they're able to right. say, Hey, here's insurance needs or not insurance needs or, totally. um, you know, for someone who's self-employed. I mean, I think a hybrid is really good, you know, and you definitely don't want to go take your whole 401k or IRA and drop it into this kind of investing right now. You will probably have a heart attack. Um, if I would have done that two or three months ago, I would have had, had a heart attack in the last <laughs> couple of months, right? You want to like, I love that you said going small. So, but when we, when you invest your 401k, just generally, whatever you mentioned, institutional investing, mutual funds and all this, um, you know, I'm okay. I don't think that's bad. Um, but talk to me about like some of the cons, I guess, of, of sure. that, you know, um, of the mutual fund kind of world. So if you were to, if yeah. you're basically to say your options are to manage some of it on your own and pick these companies this way and, and have your mm -hmm. convictions and integrity and everything built in versus not, what are the pros and cons of both? Yeah. So I'll put mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs in one bucket. Essentially they're all Great. a bundle of stocks. The differences are, I'll, I'll summarize real quick, a mutual fund has a about a 1% to 2% fee. So just for holding that, that fund, you're being charged. I'm not a big fan of mutual funds. I am a fan of index funds and ETFs, which have a fraction of a percent of fees. And essentially, yeah. they're going to get you the same returns. So in other words, yeah. you're going to pay less for the same returns. Now, the difference and as an example, just a quick yeah. math on that. If you have a million dollars when you retire and it's all in mutual funds, you're going to be paying $10,000 a year for that money to sit there. Correct. And maybe that's fine. Maybe not. But it's something to at least think about and know. Yeah. yeah. You'll get the same okay. returns if you go to an index fund or ETF because it's essentially very similar bundles of stocks. That's all these products are. And of course, there can be bonds in them too. But we tend to more focus on the stocks. Um, the difference real quick here between an index fund and an ETF, ETF is exchange traded fund. You can buy and sell ETFs midday, like let's say it's 11 o'clock on a Tuesday and an ETF is, is priced at 200 bucks. The price you pay at that exact instance is what you get. With index funds, when you buy that index fund, you don't get the price you paid mm. at that moment. You have to wait to end of day to get the price. So it's it's going to be similar. Um, so it's just a minor detail. Yeah. Those are fine. But one thing that Phil Town taught is you're going to accelerate your wealth building a lot faster by going into individual businesses. Yes, it is. Uh, it is a little more volatile. You're going to see those peaks and valleys like recently, full context to all listeners. Yep. Within the last three months, and I'm starting to see this turn around, but in the last three months, my portfolio went down close to 60%. Net worth cut down 60%. That can, as Ryan said, that can cause you to have a heart attack. But I've experienced <laughs> these times before. And the rule is you don't sell. You don't lose money. Remember rule one, yeah. lose money. Do not sell. This is the time. And of course you buy. And when the market turns around like it is right now, my returns will be very good. But, but that's the thing is you got to make your choice. Like, do you want something that's slow and steady over time? And you don't yep. see those volatile moments go into index funds or ETFs. But if you want to accelerate your wealth building, and this is something that a lot of millennials need to think about because statistically they've had a later start because of the recession and because yeah. of student loans, how do you, how do you make up the ground? Right. You've yeah. got you've yeah. got to get into stocks. Um, the Gen Z generation, as they're graduating, they're entering the workforce with better salaries than the um, millennials. Yep. So millennials, I have to say, which I'm in that generation, they definitely got a late start. Like I will say, I don't have student loans, but I had that one business. I probably had a five year late start before I started making it. Yeah, it, it yeah. yeah, and that was my own poor decision, but. Maybe it was a good decision because I learned a lot about yeah. business. <laughs> and it and is what it is, and that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I think the same thing. I had a 401k in my first job right out of college and put a ton of money in it. And I wasn't thinking about any of this stuff. It was just right. 
if I would have been managing some of that on my own or doing that, that would have been great. And maybe, and I don't think that's to say beat yourself up or not or any of that stuff. I think it's helpful. Talk a little bit, what are your perspectives on impact? I mean, so as we think Mm -hmm. about the management, meaning obviously these mutual funds, all those, all those individuals, they're, they're picking these stocks, hopefully on the same metrics, but also they're all about making money and that's not to say they're evil people or bad people, but what do you, I guess, as, as we've talked about this impact component and how are our convictions Mm -hmm. and how that matters, if you just put it in mutual funds only, like what are you losing out on versus doing it on your own? Yeah. So real quick here, ESG is hot. Essentially you've got environmental, social, and governance. The governments, I can't speak to a whole lot. From my perspective, it's more the rigor around controlling management, how they make yeah. decisions, right? That's not where a lot of people focus. It's more on the social components. And then environmental, I'd say, is probably the biggest for most yep. people. Is like what kind of environmental negative impact or positive impact does a company have? Yeah, so, carbon neutrality and all that kind of right, stuff. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So with mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs, these are assembled portfolios that can have hundreds of stocks together. And you don't know, in most cases, as an investor, what's what, what's making a positive impact or negative. A big Uh, benefit of buying stocks on your own is you can pick and choose. And we have ESG data in ticker, so you can see how things rate, right? And in that case, you can pick the businesses that align with your I mean, what, what you're looking for, what, what kind of impact, yeah, what you're, and that's actually with the millennial and even the Gen Z generation, not saying X and and boomers are, don't care, but um, Z and millennial, they care a lot about ESG and they want to invest in businesses that are meaningful to, you know, the social impacts they want to make a commitment to. And of course, environmental. Yeah. Well, and with the, if you're in, if a mutual fund is in 200 companies and to, right. full disclaimer, I have a lot of our investments are in mutual funds. So, cause I just got involved in this stuff and I'm looking, I'm not going to put all in there and, and it is what it is, but I am certain that of those 200 businesses that's investing in, there's probably a decent sized percentage of those that if I did some really deep due diligence, private investigating on them, I would be like, sick to my stomach that I have even some sort of ownership in them, Uh, whether they're taking advantage of employees, whether they're shortcutting the system with some person in a, in a developing country and, and paying Mm -hmm. low labor, you know, like generally we're moving away from that. Um, Or what is their CEO management doing on the weekend? You know, it's like, uh, you're part of that. And so again, it's not to beat up the mutual fund system, but it's to say, something to think about. So just kind of to to close this and wrap us up. I mean, where I hope people take away from this or people land is to just a baseline starting to develop a conviction and an interest in saying, where is my portfolio invested? Um, How can I think about it differently? That doesn't mean pull it all out or change everything you're doing, but start thinking about it differently, start analyzing on these things. And you, Sean, have given people awesome quick steps of, Hey, here's how to dip your toe in the water and start thinking about it. And for me, I dipped my toe in the water and I started thinking about it and I'm a little more in the water and pretty soon I'm probably just going to dive right in and then I might have a heart attack. Um, (laughs) But point being is my, my hope hope is that that's, that's kind of some of the stuff people are taking away and you start to look at it and email your financial advisor and say, Hey, can I, what's the name of the mutual fund? And do you have the, the fact sheet mm-hmm. on the mutual fund? What companies is it in? And right. take the 10 top companies that it's invested in and just see, look up the management of the mutual fund and just say, wow, that's interesting. Like, why did they do that? I mean, I, I guarantee, mm-hmm. you know, and, and at the end of the day, we're not going to get it perfect. So if you look at that right. and 70% of the mutual funds, awesome. And 30% isn't, I'm sure 70% of my ticker portfolio or my portfolio that I've evaluated on ticker mm-hmm. is great. And 30%, you're not going to get it perfect, but it's, right. I think right. if we all have a baseline conviction that helps us think about these things differently. It's going to make the world a better place as a result. And we have the responsibility as, as humans to, to do that and do that well. Totally agree. Yeah. 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 Any, any closing thoughts from you on all that stuff? And on, on ESG, I, I just have to say that, you know, whatever is meaningful to you, you know, you can get into ticker and you can find those businesses pretty quick. We'll be adding um, some features to ticker that make it a little easier to find. Right now, you got to click on a stock to see the ESG. We'll actually show it on it. We got a big table that shows all the stocks. You can filter and sort, and you'll be able to filter and sort based on ESG data. So mm. um, it just makes it a lot easier. But yeah, it's it makes it a lot more fun too to know that this is what you're 
you're invested in and this this is your criteria and this is your lane you're sticking to um totally it, it, yeah. it's fun to have control over that because previously you go back 20 years you know everybody was going into funds people weren't buying individual stocks it was, it was very rare yeah yeah and hopefully it leads to sooner financial independence for people and they're more generous with that money and they're more generous with yes. their time and that leads to it too. So it's super exciting. And yeah, man, thanks for being on and thanks for building ticker. I mean, it's, it's helped me a ton. I hope it builds a lot, helps a lot of people and um, they can find your payback time podcast. They can find ticker, mm -hmm. like all that stuff is on there. So we'll link it all in the show notes and, cool. uh, and go from there. So thanks for awesome. being on Sean. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Ryan. This is great. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We are so thankful you guys are here and listening. As always, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening apps. Uh, we would love to keep you guys up to date on new episodes that are coming out when we're launching new episodes and we're launching new seasons uh, and everything in between. So uh, when we're in season, episodes are dropping every single Wednesday. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you're up to date. Also, uh, if you're loving what we're doing, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, where we're constantly posting about our projects, what they're doing, uh, what kinds of things we're working on. We'll recycle some uh, podcasts, uh, things about our partners, all sorts of fun stuff that you want to see. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff and check out what we're doing there. And yeah, we're stoked that you guys are listening. We hope this has been really fruitful and we will catch you guys next week. And lastly, uh, as you guys all know, we always talk about all sorts of things with impact investing, uh, investment opportunities, entity structure modeling, how projects are getting capital. And as a disclaimer and a reminder, Feast Over Famine does not provide legal tax accounting or other professional advice. You should consult professional advisors concerning the legal tax or accounting consequences of any activities related to your project or a project you're supporting. Feast Over Famine doesn't consult, advise, or assist with the offer or sale of securities in any capital raising transaction. We don't do that for the direct or indirect promotion or maintenance of a market for any securities. Uh, and Feast Over Famine does not engage in any activities for which an investment advisor's registration or license is required under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940 or under any other applicable federal or federal, federal or state law or for which a broker's or dealer's registration or license is required under the U.S. Securities Exchange Act of 1934 or under any other applicable federal or state law. So there's your investment disclaimer. Uh, hopefully that's helpful if you need it. And if you ever have any questions on that side of things, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Take care.